Today we're, we're joined by Dean Bender, who's the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at uh, Qualcomm, talk a bit about Spectrum and 5G. So Dean, thanks for joining us, always thanks, appreciate thanks. it. And uh, so let's start off with, I guess, just a bigger, kind of a big picture view uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what's, I guess, what's new in terms of, you know, with 5G and, and Spectrum use there. So at Qualcomm, our approach to Spectrum for 5G is very comprehensive. So we're going to design uh, a system for 5G that takes advantage of low band, mid band, and high band spectrum and that uses every conceivable spectrum paradigm from a regulatory point of view, meaning licensed spectrum, shared spectrum, and unlicensed spectrum. To get this goal of multi-gigabit connectivity you, you, on a ubiquitous basis wherever people happen to be with ultra-low latency, ultra-high reliability for mission-critical communications, we're going to need every bit of spectrum to take advantage of to achieve that. There's also a lot of talk I know about, about, I guess, more flexible use of spectrum as well. I know in the past, spectrum has been, been very rigidly controlled. It seems like moving forward, it's going to be a, a definitely a different model, it seems like, in terms of how spectrum is going to be used, like you said, li unlicensed and licensed too. And so you talk a bit about, I guess, the, the need for that flexibility in, in the process. Sure, Dan. So just thinking about just the licensed spectrum space, we're now in an environment where it isn't just using one licensed band. So we've moved now to carrier aggregation, LTE advanced. So that means that different carriers who have different combinations of spectrum need to aggregate different bands to create one fatter virtual pipe to get you know, much better connectivity, much faster speeds. So for unlicensed, we're adding uh, LTE first, uh, a couple different technologies, not to use too many acronyms here, LTEU, LAA, and then MultiFire. And these technologies bring this concept of spectrum aggregation from the licensed space into unlicensed. So now we're not just aggregating licensed spectrum, we're also aggregating unlicensed spectrum. So then sort of the third leg of the stool from a spectrum point of view would be the shared spectrum space. Mm -hmm. Examples being 3.5 gigahertz here in the United States, 2.3 gigahertz in Europe. So there the issue is the spectrum is allocated for other uses to other types of users such as for example the United States government or European governments, but those governments we know don't use the spectrum 24-7 and they don't use the spectrum nationwide. So now what we're doing in the shared spectrum space is coming up with a way to use the spectrum when it's available and where it's available. Uh, I guess what's the view on, on being able to kind of make that process, you know, being able to actually tap into those higher bands in a commercial environment? Obviously I know you guys do a bunch of work on that. I guess what's the view on, on being able to kind of take that step and actually make that, take that from the labs and trials to the actual real world? So we're working on it, have been working on it for several years, Dan, and at a feverish pace. So at 60 gigahertz, we have the 802.11 AD mm -hmm. YGIG technology that we've, uh, we are a leader in. And we've done you know, a huge amount of work on advanced antenna features, beam forming and the like. And th those techniques are going to be very, very important. In the testing that we've done so far, the results are extremely good, so we're very, very excited about it, and the challenge is to hurry up but don't rush. And obviously, uh, the low band is going to be important as well. I know, like you said, low, mid, and high. Uh, low band was key for the uh, deployment and rollout of LTE services. I know for, uh, for the next move, obviously, there's going to be a, a big importance on that as well at some point in the process. I guess, you know, as operators look at that part of it, how, how important is it for them to have access to clean, uh, low, sub-6 gig uh, spectrum to kind of flush out their systems even more in a, in a broader deployment model. So it's extremely important, Dan. That obviously is the holy grail. If you talk to any wireless operator in the world, this would be their first choice for sure. So, but just for 5G, so in the United States, we have the 600 megahertz auction, uh, recovering additional spectrum from TV stations. That auction is in, in, the, 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 in progress, as you say, but that timetable will sync up, I think, well with 5G. Uh, but then also in places like Europe and China and other places, and uh, Japan, mm -hmm. spectrum in the three gigahertz range is uh, key for 5G. So there's no question that uh, 5G is going to have a, a sub six gigahertz element to it. Mm -hmm. And there's also no question that in our view to be a leader in 5G, you're going to have to have been a leader in 4G. Yeah, and obviously, the international harmonization of it is an important aspect as well. I know for vendors, having a, having a band that's kind of universal will be, will be kind of nice for them as well at some point. Well, sure. So uh, again, that's another one of the uh, holy grail aspects yeah. of spectrum. So we would all like there to be one spectrum band. It would be the only spectrum band that would be used and it would be perfectly globally harmonized. 
that's not the real world that we live in. There isn't going to be one, you know, 5G set of bands. There's going to be complexity there. Um, but, you know, that's uh, Qualcomm. We're pretty experienced at dealing with uh, complex spectrum scenarios, and so we're not going to wait. We're not going to, you know, hope that there is uh, harmonization. Obviously, we would like the greatest harmonization possible, and, but if there isn't harmonization, what we have to do on our end is build chips that can cover the widest swath of spectrum possible, either themselves or even in a module, to try to get the greatest economies of scale, and that's what we'll do. Well, you touched a little bit earlier on, on the unlicensed spectrum part as well. Uh, I guess what impact is that going to have in these rollouts? Because it does seem like, like we were saying earlier, I mean, operators want, want to get just as much spectrum as they can, obviously, to support services. Um, I guess, you know, the unlicensed has always been kind of tricky in terms of commercial services. I guess, what's the view on how that's going to progress? And I, was, I know you talk, touched on a little bit earlier, but I guess, how's that progressing? And how, what's, what's Qualcomm's view on, on, the, on the progress there? Yeah, so it's progressing very, very well, Dan. This is another initiative that we're very excited about. So just looking at LTE, remember when I was talking about carrier aggregation. So one of the things that many operators around the world would like to achieve for LTE is one gigabit connectivity. And in order to achieve one gigabit connectivity using carrier aggregation, if you can aggregate some of the five gigahertz on licensed band, that will allow many operators to get to the one gigabit connectivity. And that we're not talking years and years away. This is on a very short, in the short term, uh, the work on, for example, licensed assisted access in the 3GPP standards group is done. Mm -hmm. So using that technology through carrier aggregation would enable operators in the United States and around the world to get to the one gigabit connectivity. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I guess, obviously, the regulatory bodies are working feverishly and trying to free up more and more spectrum. And like you said, the Spectrum Frontiers initiative recently is ongoing as well. I guess, you know, uh, as you look at kind of what this is doing there, I mean, is it, is it, are they doing a, a pretty good job? What's, I guess what's Qualcomm, Qualcomm's view on the pace and the ability for the FCC and other, obviously, international bodies as well to kind of harmonize and, and work on, on getting spectrum freed up to support what is going to be a, a big need as part of 5G? So we think the FCC has done a fantastic job with the Spectrum Frontiers initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, they've worked actually for them at warp speed. <laughs> and uh, it, I think it's a great model for how government works with industry. For example, in Europe, they're moving ahead very, very quickly on 5G. Same thing in Asia. Everyone wants to be a leader in 5G, and 5G is seen as uh, connected deeply to national economic policy, to national industrial policy. The fact is the United States is the leader in LTE in terms of subscribers and network deployments, and I think that's created what I would call a healthy competition among uh, governments all around the world, and it, it's great and heartening to see how much uh, emphasis is being placed by governments around the world on 5G in particular, but also just on mobile technology and spectrum in, in, in general. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, I guess final question, I guess, what kind of makes Qualcomm unique in this space? Because obviously you guys have been in the industry for as long as it's really been an industry of this, but uh, I guess what makes Qualcomm unique in terms of this move towards 5G? What's kind of Qualcomm's kind of bread and butter? What's their kind of uh, unique uniqueness in, in this aspect of, of the market today? So I think our uniqueness stems, Dan, from the fact that we've done so much work on 2G, 3G, and 4G. So we've seen this movie before, and we're, as I say, we're going to work as very, very quickly on both 4G and 5G in parallel. And in terms of our spectrum policy, we don't have a overriding, rigid philosophy. Mm -hmm. Our approach to Spectrum is to do our technical homework, mm -hmm. to look at each situation deeply in a fact-driven manner on the merits, and to come up with suggested solutions that will enable the Spectrum to be put to use quickly, broadly, rapidly, and in a cost-effective manner. And I think we're on the road to do that with what's happened so far, and that's what we're going to keep doing. Sounds great. Thanks okay. so much, Dean, for the time. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot.